I wasn't there the day the camp was liberated. Uh, so I, I can't say I saw it sit, hanging on the barbed wire fence, but the GIs were there ahead of me. I said, yeah, that's where it was hanging. I never could find out what the blue was. You know, in bluing, in the old days, we put little blocks of blue color in the clothing to make it whiter. And the Nazis had all these big, long red banners everywhere, the swastika, and just plain red with the swastika. So this is, they chopped off the swastika. Yeah, the red comes through there, too. It was just sitting there, hanging around our house. We, we were living in the house of the commandant of the concentration camp, a beautiful chalet. And it was knocking around, and I think when we got, went to leave, nobody else wanted it, so I thought, this is history. My name is Roy Schaefer. I was drafted into the American Army and right out of high school in 1943. Trained in various camps in the States and then in England and then finally in France and Germany. And uh, I was at the Remagen River crossing soon after the first Americans got across there. Then we went to Aachen, the former headquarters of the, you might say, the Rome, Holy Roman Empire, Charlemagne's headquarters. And by the time we got there, Aachen was pretty well flattened, almost like Dresden. And we got to Nuremberg and uh, didn't stay there very long. And we were on our way to Munich, I think. We, in a little tiny village, we came across a convoy of American tanks, and they had V, V all over them. And we said, what's this all about? They said, the war's over. We didn't know the war was over, but that was our first intimation of it. The girls, the German girls were kissing the GIs, and the GIs were responding vigorously. Later on, it wasn't before a few weeks later, once the war was over, the army came down very hard, no fraternization. It was absolutely forbidden to fraternize with Germans and uh, the kissing was supposed to have stopped. I don't think it did, though. Anyhow, we ended up at a place called Flossenburg, uh, a tiny hamlet near the Czech border in eastern Bavaria. There's an old ruins of a castle there atop a granite hill, and tucked in a valley behind that castle was Flossenburg concentration camp. We hadn't a clue. We had never heard any intimations about these camps. But the inmates knew that something was happening. I don't know if they had secret radios or what, because they hung flags on the fence for the arriving uh, American troops. Three flags, one Russian, one British, and one American. And it looked like typical military camp, just barracks and barracks and barracks. But inside those barracks were uh, prisoners, uh, concentration camp people, who were being worked to the death at a, um, a quarry just a few hundred yards north of the camp. So people worked in a quarry, in chisels and stuff like that, until they dropped, and then they were taken to the ovens. They lived in what would look like chicken coops. I mean, the barracks, they had beds, three or four levels, at least three, I'm not sure. Just wooden boards, no mattresses or anything like that. And each person had a little tiny shelf space where they crawled. And there wasn't much of the people by then. They were down 100 or less pounds. They were all skin and bones, so a few survived. So we talked to the survivors who could speak English. Not, not many of them could speak English, but I remember there was a little clique of uh, intellectuals. And I, I think they were all Jews, but they were from Holland and uh, Denmark and various other countries who had somehow survived. And they tried to explain to us what it was really like. I was very young and it exceeded my imagination. I just didn't 
grasp the enormity of it, uh, uh, that this was just, Flossenburg was a drop in the bucket in terms of these camps. The truth came out later. And we weren't there in that week or whatever it was, the transition, the American army took charge and we were in charge of getting the toilets going again and getting the food out and most importantly, controlling the typhus epidemic. We were not in contact with Germans. However, the uh, lieutenant in charge mobilized the Germans from the town of Flossenburg, a little hamlet down the road. Every day they would come up with carts, ox-drawn carts, and take the dead people down to a cemetery for burial. So we saw the Germans and talked a little bit. I spoke a tiny bit of German. And their response was, of course, oh, horrors. We didn't have a clue what was going on here. It's hard to believe that they didn't have a clue when it was 300 yards from the village to the camp. And I'm sure many of them were employed at the camp. But uh, a sense of the civilian sense of what was going on there, we didn't get a reading on that. This was sort of a valley. Back right on the corner was a big building in which there was a great big room, maybe at least 50 feet square. And it looked like a beautiful spa because it was lined with green glazed tile. And the floor was glazed too, as I recall. And there was a lot of plumbing in the ceiling, like a fire extinguisher nozzles. And then at the back corner of that green room was a doorway with a chute, uh, just a metal chute going downwards. And at the bottom of that chute was, a, I think it was two ovens, just like a gigantic bakery oven. But that's where they would take the body and put it on a metal gurney and slide it in to the flames and the wood was below. That was the incineration. That was the final Hitler's final solution. And outside the ovens were whole, many, many piles of ashes, as though they just dumped the ashes into piles. And I assume those were human ashes. Yeah. I don't think we were there more than a month or so, frankly. By that time, most of the inmates, the majority of the inmates were on their way out and repatriation or condemnation for some of them. Eventually I went into, into medicine and back to Africa where I worked first of all with the flying doctor service and uh, later with the medical school. And so, so we've spent most of our life in Africa. Most of our kids raised there. All of our kids left their hearts in Africa. <laughs> yeah. Well, it still defies my imagination yeah. the, how anybody, any human being, could have that sort of a heart and concept. We have in our genes to be just as bad. Every race, tribe, and nation have within us the seeds of the same thing. I mean, it's very important that they remember that it did indeed happen. Those people were slaughtered. Those terrible Germans were pointing the finger. Well, look, how many fingers are pointing back to us? I'm fiercely pro-American, and the honor of my country is important to me. But uh, I often am very uncomfortable with the near association of Guantanamo with Flossenburg. The, the, the overlap there is yeah. it's a different thing altogether and I understand the logic behind it, but I'm not comfortable with it. Yeah. <laughs>